Thank you so much for hosting me here. And in general, uh, last, uh, well, basically I am from Russia and I am Russian. And uh, last four months I spent in uh, Mexico and that was a wonderful time. Right now I'm going to be a couple of months in Costa Rica and I can only say the good things about uh, these countries. And thank you so much for being that uh, hospitable. And that probably is about the good part of my presentation because the, la the rest time I'm really going to talk only about problems, problems in data platforms. And the topic is uh, data platforms without monolith or uh, data mesh. And uh, agenda wise, um, I'm going to start from the introduction to data platforms to make sure that we all are on the same page and have the same background to uh, dive deeper toward the uh, data platform challenges to cover emerging uh, architectural shifts that we currently see in the market and how these architectural shifts affected our data culture in the organization I'm working on. So section data platform overview. And I'm going to start from the very far sector and invite you to dive into the e-commerce. And from the first uh, site, I can see, I can understand that e-commerce domain in general might look very simple and trivial. That what I thought before I joined uh, e-commerce uh, company. Now, uh, grocery shopping never will be the same anymore. Now I have a uh, two years experience working in e-commerce and I can say that it's a very complex domain with different subdomains. So let's imagine that we're going to build an e-commerce uh, platform. And uh, you know that e-com uh, sector was developing pretty fast even before COVID, COVID. But right now in 2020 uh, year, we know that the revenue of e-commerce in total growth uh, 30%. So let's imagine we are millionaires and going to build this uh, e-commerce platform uh, our own. So probably we would come up with uh, some microservices uh, architecture, uh, the distributed one, and we can see that there are different domains. The main of product catalog, basically the first thing that you need to do, need to do when you run your platform, you need to uh, define a list of products that you are going to sell. You need to define prices, define some taxes, etc. You need to set up supply chain to really deliver these products in time and make sure they are available in a warehouse. You need to integrate with some payment system. You need to promote your products so that more and more consumers uh, join uh, your platform. There are different domains and usually uh, we write and implement uh, a microservice for each and every domain. In real life, they probably would be even more uh, gran granular, but uh, let's keep it simple. What are the main characteristics of this architecture? Well, there is an owning team of each and every microservice, right? We have a feature team that implements the service, the REST API, the database. Uh, the main feature in REST API is that we sign a contract. We really uh, commit to provide a contract between each uh, microservices and we are responsible for making this API available uh, and set up some API and documentation with that. Uh, DevOps met methodology also came uh, to game uh, in the times when we decided that uh, distributed systems are better than uh, monoliths. So what is DevOps really? We decided that having developers and uh, sysadmins who are deploying our applications is very bad praxis because these teams are siloed and uh, the process of hands-off uh, might be very, very complicated. So remember all these uh, uh, notes, we will definitely come back to them when we speak more about data platform. 
Uh, now let's just assume that each of these microservices generates tons of data. And there are many people in the company who need this data. There are special team analysts or machine learning engineers, and they are responsible for gathering insights from the data that is generated by our microservices. And in order to uh, gather these insights, we need a single place where these domains can be merged and analyzed together. So we decided to build these huge monolithic databases. We call them data warehouses. They are relational, they require schema, they are giant, and they really enable insights. What kind of questions can be answered with these kind of uh, warehouses? Basically, the uh, summary of sales for, for the last uh, year, for example, or um, what is the retention uh, policy for our customers, or uh, how out of the stock events last year affected uh, our revenue? There are many interesting questions to answer. When the analyst team was joined with machine learning engineers, plus additional data formats, semi-structured ones uh, came to a uh, game, we decided that implementing and maintaining a relational schema of the data warehouse might be costly and that really takes time to support it. So we decided to introduce data lakes, which really, uh, and uh, in these data lakes, we can really grab everything from our services, from internal, from external, from our microservice databases. And that allows us to easily uh, swim in this data lake, find the data where, where, uh, which we need. Uh, and when we uh, define the schema for this data that uh, is required by us, we can implement uh, data marts, which is a form of data that is already prepared for the purpose of uh, this particular customer. What about architecture? So these are the architectural diagram that they took from public uh, sites of AWS, Azure, and uh, uh, GCP. You can see that all the tools in the middle are really different. Uh, some of them are streaming solutions. The other one are batching solutions. Some of them are for data lake, the other for warehouses. But the purpose of this diagram is to really show you that from the very high level perspective, that they look pretty much the same. We have uh, sources from the one side. We have consumers from the other side. And in the middle, there is some data platform, and that is usually centrally managed by data platform team. Here are the same schema simplified. So we have uh, data producers, we have data consumers, and in the middle, there is a data team. These teams are siloed, similar to how we saw it before DevOps uh, approach happened. Two teams were separated and they hardly, hardly communicated with each other. And in terms of communication, usually this is happen uh, horizontally. So when I am as a data analyst need some sales report, for example, or out of stock report, or I am a machine learning engineer that needs a particular data point, I come to data team and ask, probably I ask even not directly, but through a product manager. I gave them some brief requirement that I have in mind, not really strict because I haven't saw a data source. And after that data team puts my request to the very end of the backlog. And there are multiple teams consumer teams that have multiple requirements, but there, are sing but there is a single data team that cannot really supply all of them. And we believe that's the problem. So I'm moving to the challenges part, or I can also name this part, how to not make a data swam from your data platform. Uh, and that is also the place where my personal story begins because we really build the same. And a couple of years ago, uh, I joined uh, the client 
who is uh, one of the world's leading food and beverage companies, a really wo uh, worldwide famous uh, one. And we built a data platform from, from scratch for them. That was a Greenfield uh, data platforms. Uh, customers uh, were happy uh, for the first time only. Because at some point we noticed uh, an increase in customer needs. We, at some point we proved the abilities of the platform and more and more teams started joining us as a consumers. And we really failed to satisfy them on. So you can see the data engineering team became very unhappy at some point. And I'm going to dig uh, into why. As we saw on the very first slides, uh, data warehouse by default is a monolith. That's a sin single uh, repository of uh, all the data that belongs to a company. And by definition, that is a monolithic structure. And that is the main problem in here. Uh, the problem is in scale, but not in scale of technologies or tools, but in scale in terms of the, how teams work. We can see uh, in the picture that consumers are unhappy, data team is unhappy, data producers are also unhappy. Why is that? Well, for data team, uh, they have a big backlog and they really struggling to keep pace with all the business demands. There are multiple teams that want something from data team, but data team is trying to juggle these priorities and uh, satisfy everybody. This is uh, impossible. Um, another thing why data team is unhappy is that is the fact that it doesn't have really much context about the data that they are moving from one place to another. And uh, if we believe that we when we develop a, a website for uh, running sales, we know that there are microservices and feature teams that are working on these microservices and they own this domain. They understand the slang of sales, the slang of marketing. They know that they are going to release some feature and that is very important for the company to uh, release this feature. But when you work uh, in the middle of these two teams, you don't really know what is the effect of the data product that you are going to pass to, uh, to data consumers. You are not closely communicate with them and that really demotivated uh, the team. I know that uh, intelligent professions like uh, we are, uh, that is very important for them to feel uh, commitment to something bigger, to, to see this uh, North Star that can uh, help to keep uh, the, the team motivated. And at some point we're losing this motivation. Um, another important problem that we faced with in our company was uh, inefficient hands-off. So when data team complete some pipeline, complete some data product, it really needs to hand it off to the consumer's team so that they could uh, provide some acceptance criteria, validation, etc. And because these teams are different, the priorities of consumer team may be already changed and they don't really have an available person to check the data. And after two weeks, they can uh, find an availability. But data engineer who worked on this pipeline already moved to something else and he forgot, uh, for, forget, uh, forgot what was uh, there with this pipeline. Uh, and that uh, this kind of inefficient uh, hands-off also made uh, everybody uh, happy. Another problem in here is lack of uh, ownership. So Mm, theoretically, the ownership of uh, all the pipelines of all data transformations uh, belong to a data team. But in reality, shared responsibility is nobody's responsibility. And when you are working hard on some of the new pipelines, you need to switch back and forth to see uh, what is the alerting or some bugs, bugs or some requests changed happened on your previous uh, 
pipeline. And this kind of uh, uh, switching back and forth also was uh, very affected uh, negatively our performance. I hope that makes sense for you as much as for me. Here we are moving to the part of uh, emerging uh, architectural shifts. Uh, and in particular about uh, data mesh. So what is a data mesh? Um, the concept of data mesh was published a little more than a year ago by a principal uh, consultant uh, in ThoughtWorks. And that really about bringing uh, distributed uh, patterns to data platform world. So data mesh is a data platform version of microservices. And uh, remember the slide that I showed at the very uh, beginning where we developed this uh, uh, marketplace where we wanted to sell our products. There were uh, several points and most of them you will see in the data mesh concept. And if to summarize all of them, I can uh, say that there are three really key points in here. The first one, we need to be domain driven and we need to be build domain driven feature teams, which is uh, a lot about motivation of the teams and how they are structured, how they are organized and work uh, together and what is the product that they are going to publish. What is the value that they bring to the whole company? To the business. The second one is data ops. And uh, if you um, started thinking that this is similar to DevOps concept, you're probably on the right way. That is very much the same concept of data of uh, DevOps that uh, goes to, that moves to a data platform world. And that's more about uh, self-serving data infrastructure. The third one is that we need to really treat all the data that we publish to the company uh, as a product. And I'm going to elaborate on each of these three uh, points in the next slides. First one, uh, feature teams which publish their data. So remember this picture from the very first slide, and we call these teams who are working on a particular microservice a feature team. And we assign a new responsibility for them. We say right now that from now on, you're not only going to publish your API and SLAs and documentation around this API, but you also need to internally publish the data that lives in your microservice and that your microservice generates. And you need to do it in a special standard format that includes documentation, uh, data lineage, uh, SLAs uh, that also take place uh, in APIs according to some standards. I'm going to uh, cover these standards on the next slides. Um, if the team that develops, develops a microservice doesn't have uh, uh, data engineering uh, skills, we can accompany and uh, data engineering uh, roles can accompany these people together to join source oriented feature teams that have published their data to the rest of the company, probably to the data lake in a format that is standardized and available to the rest, the whole of the company. Now you may wonder, what about external data sources? Usually there are CRM systems, some legacy systems or external APIs or external scrappers, uh, uh, file drops, emailed files. I saw many of uh, different variations in the company I'm working on. So what about them? Um, and the idea is that uh, feature teams that were source oriented on the previous slide and were located here on the left uh, part, now they are from the right part uh, of this slide. And uh, uh, those are analysts and uh, machine learning engineers 
who needs a particular team. So we can treat uh, some report, uh, supply chain report, out of stock report, sales report as a product. And we can assign this feature team to be responsible for the whole pipeline from the very source to the very end. And uh, this analyst and ML guys are also accompanied and uh, they are taking help from uh, data engineers. And the main idea in here is that data engineers are not jumping from one team to another. They always assign to one uh, team and they know the domain uh, of this team because they are closely working together right now. And they know all the internal kitchen of it, all the domain, the slang, etc. They know what value it brings to the uh, to the business. So this source data needs to be wrapped according to the same standards and published to the data lake to be accessible to the rest of the company in a similar way as we saw in the previous slide. These raw data products from now on are available for everybody else, but feature teams are the only teams who are responsible for each, each for its own raw data product. And for, from this all data product, we can, uh, with help of some transformation and uh, ETL tools, we can um, create a data mart, which is the product that we initially intended to build and that uh, is required by the analyst to gather these uh, insights. And this data mart actually will be also a data product that should have a documentation uh, API uh, is accessible way. The second pillar is the fact that we need to treat data as a product. Uh, on the previous slide, uh, I already dropped this word like discoverable, accessible, uh, reliable, etc. And uh, from what I heard from uh, machine learning engineers, from uh, data analysts, from people who work uh, closely with data, they really spend up to 50% of their time just to seeking the right data and bringing it to the right uh, place. And uh, in the era where uh, when uh, data is in your gold and we need to have a very short iteration between data generation and gathering insight from this data, uh, this waste of 50% of the time of an engineer really sound uh, really ridiculous. So the questions that they really are struggling to answer are, does data exist at all in the company? So there are some legacy systems, some new systems. There is a data lake, a lot of data sources. How do I really understand where is the data that I need? And can I trust it? And is it fresh at all? Uh, can, I, um, can I rely on, on this? What, what are the dependencies uh, of the data that I'm going to use? And uh, I am implying that in order to answer easily to the questions that uh, were on the previous slide, we need to implement a universal set of standards so that every team that publish some data publicly to the rest of the organization, not only responsible for the data piece, piece itself, but also for documentation, SLA, uh, validation, uh, uh, and everything that uh, needs to be done in order to make this data helpful for everybody else. So that's not your a uh, particular data asset that you need for an ad hoc report, but rather that is a data asset that the company uh, has. And we really need to do our best in order to, uh, to publish it in a, in a discoverable way. So what does it mean discoverable way? Um, this problem might be solved with the uh, tools such like data catalog and we know there are some proprietary uh, tools and uh, open source one all of them have some disadvantages and, dif uh, and advantages but usually it is a, a ui that has an index of all your data 
and where you can really type uh, customer and some list of uh, data yeah, tables probably uh, will be displayed to you and you can see some metrics of the data, who uses it, uh, where the data comes from, uh, what is the lineage, uh, when the, the last time it was updated, etc. And these uh, kind of uh, metrics are really, really essential in order to build a reliable uh, tool. The data needs to be addressable. That means that um, there are different um, skills in the company, right? Somebody may be familiar with uh, Python, the others know only SQL, the other only can uh, access data through the UI, and we need to come up with a way that is uh, equally helpful for all these people. Data needs to be trustworthy, which really uh, means some complex uh, validations and alerting and logging um, uh, in place when you uh, publish your data. Data needs to be self-describing. So uh, what is the domain, uh, when the last time it was uh, updated uh, and everything that could help all the other teams to understand what are you doing uh, in your domain. Um, that was about theory and uh, it was uh, the good part. <laughs> in practice, I don't think uh, we have some silver bullet to solve all the problems that I mentioned uh, in complex. So there is no out of the box solution, but there are tools. Uh, I think most, mm, most of the ones that I listed here are open source. So for data quality, we have great expectations, DQ, maybe there are some other ones. It's just uh, the one that I took from um, the customers who are around me. Uh, there is a data catalog tools. Um, there are documentation and data lineage, a DBT tool that we also uh, use, but the main disadvantage of uh, DBT is that it only works uh, with a SQL kind of transformation and only lives in a warehouse. Um, there are data reliability tools such as Monte Carlo and we use it uh, um, as well. This one sits in uh, your warehouse and tries to find the uh, outliers. For example, uh, when you have the table and feed this table every day, but then you have a couple of days gap, Monte Carlo will uh, alert you in a Slack message, for example. Um, data ops, similar to how uh, when distributed systems uh, came to this uh, game, we, have, we had a DevOps uh, revolution and decided to bring these two roles of developers and sysadmins together and assign them a role of building a self-serve uh, uh, programming uh, infrastructure the same way we need to do now with data. So the role of data ops um, that uh, we see in the concept of data mesh is to really uh, provide a simple way to publish your data to the rest uh, of the company so that the lower level skilled uh, uh, people can do it uh, with no uh, trouble and in a short uh, period of time. So there are really complex uh, uh, problems uh, that needs to be solved by this team. Um, maintaining warehouse cluster, maintaining a data lake, maintaining validation tools, uh, data catalog, data lineage tools. There is a huge list of uh, responsibilities that could be taken by uh, this data ops team. So in summary, there are three um, main key points in data mesh, data, uh, domain-driven data teams, data ops, and data as a product. What it means for me as a data engineer, what do I need to do tomorrow in our, if I want to implement data mesh? Well, domain data-driven feature teams, first of all, means that you need to do organizational restructure. 
And for many companies, especially for enterprises, that is a very challenging task. So there is a data analyst team and there is a data engineering team and they really have own priorities. They are separate departments and they report to different people. Um, so that is hard to merge and combine these teams to be feature teams. Um, additionally, these feature teams um, uh, commit to new responsibilities. So um, they not only publish their APIs, but now they also publish their data as a product with, with the documentation, metrics, uh, statistics, uh, etc. The second one, data ops, is probably the most uh, complex of these three and the, the most uh, technical. So there are a lot of tools and most importantly, the gluing, uh, mm, the glue of all these tools that combine them all together and uh, provides a very easy way for other teams to publish these reliable pro products. And this is the sphere I believe that we need to um, explore more. Uh, the data mesh concept was uh, published just uh, a little bit more than a year ago. And I believe that there are uh, some open source tooling that uh, is going to appear uh, in the market in the nearest uh, future. But in general, I see it as a, a infrastructure as a code with the help of Terraform or uh, similar tools, we need to combine all this tooling for validation documentation together. Um, data as a product, uh, what it really means for us is that we need to come up to the universal standard and publish it uh, to the rest uh, of the company so that other departments and other teams publish their data according to the standard. Plus, additionally, in data as a product, we have this uh, new role of data owner, similar to how we have for uh, microservice and uh, in operational uh, systems that uh, really a person who is responsible for evolution of the product and for maintaining this data product as a reliable piece of uh, an asset of the organization. Um, where we are as a company with uh, all these nice uh, theoretical uh, um, concepts, so I believe we are uh, somewhere here. We are not already very unhappy uh, as we used to be, but not completely happy as uh, we can be. And uh, what we did uh, recently, uh, here I have uh, these points. Uh, so first of all, uh, our manager uh, come up with the concept that he calls uh, pod teams, but in the terminology of the data mesh that really feature teams. And uh, he decided to make this slice between uh, different uh, roles uh, in the organization, uh, uh, combine them all together and uh, uh, they will be really uh, glued by the single goal of publishing a new feature. Uh, the second one is data ops team. Uh, in the company I'm working on, we call it a platform team. And right now this team is responsible for uh, making um, for other uh, data engineers, it's very easy to um, publish their uh, data. Right now, uh, because of the architecture that we took um, uh, under the hood of our warehouse, this is not very easy to publish uh, a data, but for such uh, uh, big enterprises as uh, we are, I believe we are uh, in good shape and step-by-step step making this uh, progress toward uh, the data mesh. Uh, great expectations I mentioned, we use it for validation. DBT is a really nice tool for data catalog, for data lineage and documentation. The only 
but uh, the big disadvantage of that is that it only provides SQL interface and only uh, lives in the warehouse. So um, you may wondering, do my company, does my company need a data mesh at all? So here are the questions to uh, ask yourself. And uh, if uh, your company has multiple different domains and if uh, there are multiple data sources and uh, the most importantly, if you believe that data engineering team becomes a bottleneck for the rest of the company, uh, that probably uh, a good idea to start working on a data mesh and uh, explore some tooling um, around that. That was my last uh, slide. So I am ready for questions. Thank you very much, Daria. That was a great, uh, a great talk. Spasiba was short. Um, before, so to give everybody time to, to formulate questions, right? So use the, um, use the chat if you want, or just open the microphone. I would love to have an open conversation about what Daria just, uh, just explained. But to give everybody some time. So in those feature teams that you described, there's also people who do traditional development, right? So it would be, uh, if you're talking about the payment system, they're also working on the front end. Or would that be limited to the people working on the back end, on the data side? How, how does that work? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I believe that the main goal of feature teams is to, is to combine people in a way that they have a single goal. They have a single goal to implement a feature. And this feature is usually a service. And ha service have a front end, back end, and a database under the hood. And it, uh, as we now see, it also is responsible for publishing this data uh, publicly to the rest uh, of the company. So I believe there should be um, multi cross-functional uh, feature team that combines data analyst, data owner, uh, backend engineer, front-end engineer, UX designer, uh, QA engineer, whatever professions we now have in the uh, software engineering world, that's a really nice practice to combine them and to glue them uh, towards the single uh, goal of uh, publishing a feature to the uh, business. And they will feel good about that because they share the, their knowledge, they share domain knowledge, uh, most importantly, and um, um, they have really have the feeling of commitment to something uh, uh, bigger and we that's what we love about our profession to see the results and to see that the work that you have done and uh, that you are working eight time uh, at eight hours a day <coughs> I'm sorry eight hours uh, a day uh, not just to empty space but uh, you are doing something helpful great Anybody else? So I got one, if, if I may. Uh, hi, Daria, an enlightening talk. And you got us thinking on problems we didn't know we had, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, now, one of the nuances, so I like this idea. It's almost utopical where everyone starts sharing their data under common standards. And you already uh, mentioned that one of the key challenges is making everyone uh, comply with the standards such that everything is shared in the same fashion. But for me, there's a deeper issue that has to do with the data governance as such. Like, should everyone really have access to everyone else's data or should be, uh, how do you manage uh, permissions, access, um, accountability about who is reading whose data and doing what with it? Uh, so, so it's kind of like, like very nice sharing, but but then how do you know what's going on, especially in the corporate side of stories, where this is particularly important? Yeah, that's a very good uh, question. I bet you are from security department, uh, 
or something. So, uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> the data platform team that I mentioned, or how we call them in data mesh, uh, data ops team, one of its responsibilities is to provide uh, security to the data that can be some role-based uh, access uh, control. And when you publish the data to the rest of the company, company, I, I don't mean that it is completely available to each uh, role and uh, every person in there, but uh, with the data, with metrics, with documentation, you also publish probably the roles uh, uh, to which this data is available. And usually this kind of uh, uh, publishing is read-only, so you don't have a, a right uh, access and only the feature team who is responsible for maintaining uh, the, the feature itself um, is responsible for, uh, also can uh, write uh, the same uh, data. So read-only access and additionally a set of uh, roles that is published by uh, uh, feature teams. Additionally, the global government uh, governance uh, of this repository of a data lake of a warehouse is done by a data platform team or how it is called in a, a data mesh um, data team. Thanks. What's next? Oh. Well, while you think that you have, I have one more, and that has to do with the, the scale of the teams themselves, right? So data engineers and, and data scientists or data analysts, they're, they're relatively hard to come by in many organizations. They're just starting out to, um, to even see that as a separate role. Uh, so including one in every feature team will not be possible unless you have, you know, you have quite a quite a bit of skill with the number of people and projects that you have. Do you have any sense of how large a company needs to be before a full, uh, fully populated feature team makes makes any sense? Do you do you have an idea, or is there a hybrid mode, something in between? Yeah, I would definitely. So uh, we can um, judge that there are several uh, levels of data maturity that uh, companies uh, can have. And uh, some of uh, companies does not have a data platform at all. The other ones are doing data lake, the other one are on a data warehouse uh, stage uh, still. And uh, that really uh, the answer to your question really compares uh, on the data maturity, not only uh, with the data or with the size of the organization. The company I am working on probably have a dozens of uh, thousand of uh, uh, employees and hundreds of employees in our uh, department. So right now we really see this uh, uh, necessity of bringing teams in into uh, feature-oriented uh, uh, groups uh, of people. But I believe that the if the level of data maturity of your organization is not uh, still on a certain level, the data mesh may only bring damage and uh, uh, cause to uh, to your company. So you really need to start considering uh, data mesh if you, if you see, and especially if the business already sees that something is going wrong and data engineering team uh, is struggling to uh, supply all the demand. Thank you. Any other questions? questions? Oh, sorry, sorry. Clement. No, sorry. Uh kind of not necessarily a question, but food for thought that I, I liked very much Dida's comment on uh, this continuum of data maturity where suddenly a data warehouse is a stage towards a mesh. And I think it aligns very well your, with your idea, Franz, where if you only have a specialized team of folks, you can't disaggregate your teams, then the, that team is gonna consolidate everything in a single phase, in a single place. So just as how the team is centralized somewhere, all your data is also centralized in a data warehouse. 
as you grow and mature, you can start decentralizing the data sources. You have data engineers, then you can hire data engineers into different, different feature teams. And rather than having data warehouse at the feature level, you have these, um, and that had this new, this cool words, it's a kind of data mesh approach where everyone's contributing their data to the mesh rather than having it centralized somewhere. So it's a very interesting concept. Anybody else? Questions once, twice. Dadia, thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you for taking the time. And um, for everybody who is here for the first time, we have a webinar about data science every last Thursday of the month, usually in Spanish, sometimes when there's a good reason for an exception like this one in English. And I hope to see you all uh, again in, um, when is that in April? So that would be April 29th. Look forward to seeing you there. Have a great evening. Bye bye. Muchas gracias. Uh, hasta <laughs> luego. Hasta <laughs> luego. Spasiva dos vedaña. <laughs> gracias.